So, we're just going to talk about some of these uh, important issues. Um, and uh, specifically, we're going to focus on how to stabilize the condition hemodynamically in the detection trauma. And then, after that, Ali will be talking about non operative interventions for the detection trauma. Um, there are a few uh, papers written about the uh, predictive scores in the trauma. And uh, why we need some of these scores is actually to try to qualify the severity of the trauma that we encounter in our ED. And the most common one, the most familiar one people always talk about is the pediatric trauma score, which looks at various things like the airway, CNS, body weight, the solid blood pressure, etc. All of us know about this. Uh, but it was actually not developed based on the uh, outcome for various confounding factors, but it's a tool based on weight, solid blood pressure, wounds, and fractures. And uh, although it's controlled to coronary mortality, uh, it does not perform as well as uh, the adult systems. So this is the little prior that everybody talks about whether it's in pediatrics or in adults. And uh, the three more serious things other than uh, hemorrhage, hemorrhage, hemorrhage is biography, acidosis, and hypothermia in pediatric trauma. And they actually form a vicious cycle. Uh, with a lot of experience from trauma, I think the most um, traumatic place to be in uh, has been in the Middle East, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, and there have been quite a few good studies that arose, uh, arisen from uh, this traumatic event uh, over the last 10 to 11 years. And shock event. So there was a score that was uh, published a couple of years ago in Pediatrics uh, 2011, and they actually uh, came on the score based on the uh, experience in. Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, in Iraq. So they identified all children 18 years of age in the US military established a joint theatre trauma registry from 2002 to 2009, seven years, admitted to a CSH with traumatic injuries in Iraq and Afghanistan. So George Bush actually did some I suppose, scientific book for pediatric trauma. And uh, they identified various associated factors with mortality using uh, univariate and multivariate regression modeling and they developed a score and then validated it uh, from the German Trauma Registry. <coughs> so they came up with this big score, which is basically base deficit, biography, INR, and GS, uh, GCS. And uh, they have a uh, area under the curve of 0.89, quite good, uh, with uh, good uh, predictive value. So essentially, uh, the authors are saying that they BIG needs to be a good predictor. And for hypothetical patients with a big score of 26, for example, base deficit of 10, INR 3.6, and GCS of 6, the predicted mortality is 50%. Uh, so I think the, the surgeons are, have been discussing this, and we have been looking, we have been in the process of looking at our own pharma, healthy pharma registry to see whether it's happening or not. It may still be in the PTS that is more important to us. I said these are some recent studies that came about. So you look at the big score and you uh, uh, break them down into three components. It's basically base deficit, which is acidosis, and INR, which is basically an indirect uh, indicator of biography and the injury. And these are two of the factors I talked about in the video file. And of course, this is another paper that just came up, I think, recently on, on the base deficit as a long-term prognostic factor in severe pediatric trauma patients. French paper. We looked at 100 severely traumatized children and looked at endpoint in hospital mortality and uh, secondary endpoints on discharge in uh, six month outcomes. Uh, and we found that uh, base deficits could be used to predict long term mortality in this children. So, back again to this, and we're going to focus on polyculopathy in this triad. And this is the whole uh, cascade uh, that happens when there's trauma uh, leading to. A trauma induced biography in uh, major trauma, whether it's kids or adults. And it's an estimated 10% uh, of these severe trauma patients are hypercoagulable and uh, present very early after injury. Uh, reasons for coagulation disorders would be major blood loss, like what I mentioned just now, dilution induced biography by, induced, uh, by infusing probably not so appropriate fluids during suspicion. Massive release of tissue factors from the site of injury, 
uh, and other factors like hypothermic acidosis, hypovolemia, and hypoperfusion. There's also a post-injury hyperpoidable state, the other extreme, and they may result from uh, increased uh, tissue factor dependent thrombin generation, uh, and also various other cascades that actually get uh, activated when the whole traumatic process is uh, activated. Uh, and this can result from uh, Breakdown of fresh clots, uh, leading to hyperfibrinosis, that can also uh, contribute uh, to fibrinity to a certain degree. So, some people look at uh, ABCs and CABCs and all that in different ways. Like Marco said, in trauma, C is very important, but of course, airway and bleeding is also equally important. And people talk about damage control resuscitation. Essentially, permitting um, a bit of hypertension, which we'll talk about, uh, and whether it's applicable in children. And we're talking about, we also talk about chemotherapy resuscitation, and subsequently the surgeons will talk about damage control surgery. And it's a cascade where, um, from the from the from the uh, field, uh, initial stabilization in the field, and subsequently all the way up to uh, massive transfusion protocol and other things. So in pediatrics, does it apply, and how? Does the hemodynamics actually uh, differ in adults? So this is from Jean. We tried to rationalize it, um, and uh, the whole cascade from temperature control to uh, issues like cardiopathy, major trauma, and circulation is very important. Uh, and Jean came up with this thing. I'm not a simple person, so I basically talk, talk about when we talk about resuscitation, resuscitating the hemodynamics of the patient. We're talking about the volume. The volume resuscitation giving correct volume for the preload for the heart to continue pumping uh, to give enough oxygen to the tissues, but also hemostatically stabilizing the patient in resuscitation. And in hemostatic resuscitation, there's interplay between pressure and clotting factors and clotting, like we talked about just now, because there's a whole cascade of cryopathy that is activated when there is major trauma. And the clots are unstable if the pressure is too good. Okay? And therefore, that is the concept where the adults talk about permissive hypotension, where you actually permit a bit of hypotension to allow the clots to stabilize and not screw up the uh, viable state of the patient. And essentially, people are talking about maintaining a solid blood pressure of more than 80 to 90, with the mean arterial pressure of 60, to prevent the risk of bleeding from clot distortion. So, again, we want to prevent, uh, we try to minimize progressive systemic coagulopathy and acute endogenous coagulopathy. And therefore, uh, giving too much fluids, especially too much of the wrong type of fluids, is not physiological. And uh, we aggravate at the same time, we need to be mindful of pressure and the, the amount of volume that you actually administer to the patient. And that's why the adults accept for severe injury because uh, if too much fluid goes to the brain, uh, so it's also no good. Uh, in the absence of severe injury, uh, the adults talk about permissive hypotension in major polypharma. So NIH has uh, recommended and endorsed permissive hypotension in adults without the injury. And uh, this has been accepted and I think that this is the latest ninth edition of ATLS. So our kids similar to adults. So first we look at their response to shock. So the normal blood volume of the child is about 80 mL per kilo. But their response to hypovolemia is different. So again, this is a classical uh, thing I will show. The kids' blood pressure tend to hold on at a cliff and then after it drop after a certain point, and the heart rate goes up. Whereas adults, the blood pressure will drop very early and the heart rate will go up. So uh, if they think the kids tend to have a, a period of what we call compensated shock, where the blood pressure holds, but the heart rate goes up. So that, with that in mind, the other question we need to ask is, in terms of similarity to adults, what is the response to coagulation profile where there's transfusion and trauma? So this is a very simple paper where we looked at change in platelet counts for forming massive transfusion, and obviously the more blood volumes you transfuse, the platelets uh, become lower and lower. And when you look at uh, records of uh, some patients uh, less than 15 years old over a four-year period in one trauma center, we found that there were 1,000 patient records. Uh, 
a significant proportion had elevated corrugation studies. Another paper showed the incidence of early corrugation between shock was about 27% and 38.3% in kids uh, with major trauma associated with mortality of 22% and 16.8%. This is another paper that looked at 102 children uh, in age of 6 years old and 72% uh, of them were found to have abnormal PT and 38% abnormal PTT. The early intervention with transamic acid, <coughs> I think uh, the adults probably know this more than us. Uh, transamic acid is a synthetic, uh, synthetic derivative of lysine and minimizes blood loss by uh, reversible blockade of uh, lysine by inside and uh, it is anti-fibromolytic uh, action uh, does have some uh, value in pharma patients this was validated in the CRASH-2 study uh, that showed that uh, transamic acid reduced all-cause mortality in the first month after pharma and giving transamic acid between 1 to 3 hours of injury reduced the risk of death due to bleeding in uh, these adult patients and besides the adult the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health uh, came up with a statement uh, one and a half years ago and uh, based on the crash trial study and uh, basically validating that cancer acid is good for you. And basically the group recommended that timely administration of cancer acid is preferable within the first three hours of trauma for children and it is likely to be beneficial. And they recommend following growing doses of uh, 15 mg per kilo in maintenance was of 2 mg per kilo. Again, this is based extrapolated from the adult crash to uh, studies in the adult trauma patients. So, where are we in massive transfusion protocol? We activated, like we saw in the, the same watch just now, where there's massive or uncontrolled bleeding. And, uh, the, and like I mentioned before, we're talking about managing a balance between hemodynamic resuscitation and hemostatic resuscitation. So there are various definitions of massive transfusion. Um, in adults, it's a definition of based on more than one blood volume in 24 hours or more than 50% of blood volume in 4 hours. In children, it's uh, defined as a transfusion of more than 40 mm of blood volume from Australian Red Cross blood service. And there are various uh, MPP protocols in pediatrics, from RSH, University of Michigan, British Columbia, etc. and NHS in the UK. And again, back to this, and this is where we talk about the applicability of permissive hypertension in children uh, when they, 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 they have an MTP. So at what threshold do we permit hypertension in children? <coughs> we do not permit hypertension. So if you go back to this, by the time you allow hypertension in a child, the child is going to go to the mortuary. Right? So we do not allow hypertension. We do not ever allow hypertension. But we allow tachycardia, I suppose, we allow isotension. Right? Uh, Low, norm level of blood pressure. But you cannot, you cannot wait for the blood pressure to crash. By the time you wait for blood pressure to crash, you are going on the cliff. And this is our protocol, ABCs again, but like uh, Rahul said, basically important to look at the volume and circulation. And the circulation is closely parallel to just not just the volume that you lose, but also the coagulability, the bleeding that is happening concurrently and post injury. Our primary uh, indication would be when the child is uh, having uncontrolled bleeding and child is willing to be given more than 40 mm per kilo of fluid bolus or more than 20 mm per kilo of blood products uh, and uh, we allow tachycardia if there is no dead injury okay, and uh, because kids are more difficult uh, we have various color codes for different sizes and uh, we have this activated different volumes of the blood and blood products tablets and so on Is MTP precise enough to address all the post injury issues in coagulation? And do we just dump in platelets whenever uh, the bleeding occurs? And does one size fits all? Fit all huh? And uh, there are a lot of these issues that we talked about. And of course, the answer is no. Huh? And there's this paper that Gene brought to our attention uh, in Journal of Trauma Acute Care Surgery, uh, where we looked at efficacy of hemostatic resuscitation correcting coagulopathy, uh, and essentially, uh, then compared with both them, which we talk about afterwards. And they found that of this 106 study patients, um, there was no improvement in both parameter during ongoing pain. So even though they had 
MVP protocol for them, the validation profile was still not very well controlled. That's interesting. Five minutes ago. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so people talk about goal directed therapy uh, for coagulopathy in major trauma, and this is where people talk about thrombo elastometry TEM. Uh, where basically you have this very uh, fanciful machine that analyzes the viscoelastic elastic properties of clot formation as a immediate point of testing. It's a rapid POC to manage cardiopathy, and there's been, uh, I think, Kerala and OT and so on. In women and all that, where they have PPH and all that, uh, this has also been used, and it's goal directed, basically trying to calibrate the cardiopathy as the patient continues to require acute resuscitation. Uh, so it's an established method for hemostasis uh, testing, and uh, basically it's, yeah, it was first developed by this uh, German fellow, or this Austrian fellow, many, many years ago, 1940s and 1950s. And it's been shown to be able to sensitively identify patients with post-injury hypercoagulopathy as well. And it basically, it, it basically gives you this very nice reaction curve with four key parameters, and they talk about things like clotting time, Top formation time, maximum top firmness, and lysis index, and there are various other uh, additional calculated parameters, so it looks very fancy for us. I think TFT has bought one machine for the uh, OMG, for the OMG. It's very fancy, for, it gives you this curve and it tells you uh, there and there what happens, how to correct accordingly. So it measures a lot of these other parameters. Apparently, this is a normal trace, apparently, this is a hyper coagulable trace, and so on. People have even further uh, subdivided it into how to respond and how to uh, respond to the coagulation profile as the patient continues to require resuscitation. Okay. And these are the norms for adults for surgery, trauma, and obstetrics that uh, Rotem is a company that's come up with. Limitations are that, of course, they're not responsive to, they may not be responsive to everything, for example, not responsive to effects of. The brain factor of the antagonist and uh, sensitivity for coercion factor deficiencies and so on may not be that good. Right? And it still cannot replace the classical INR and so on. But again, it is something that we need to look at further augment how we chemotherapy resuscitate the patients. So, this is an algorithm I think from Denver Health Medical Center that uh, has an algorithm for managing patient TPH on TG or TM. This is another paper from uh, <coughs> US paper where they have a protocol for managing deep source and so on. Another one where they basically respond to the coefficient profile based on the real time, real -time studies and the TEG of the experience. So, I can similar to adults, uh, can we apply what you know? And it's been established for a couple of years now, the technology is there. Okay. So, this is a paper in the British Journal Anesthesia uh, two years ago, uh, looked at uh, compared. Work them with standard regression profile and look at they took 288 blood samples from 50 subjects. And of course, uh, PT and PTT cannot be integrally used to work them. But it does serve another purpose. I don't need that okay. So then, this, uh, this Austrian paper asked Oxford went to look at 407 children and actually did the work them profile for these children, age norms, and he created Age dependent reference ranges for Rotem as essays, and uh, the most striking finding was that subjects age 0 to 3 months exhibited accelerated initiation and propagation of coagulation. So you cannot just table. So I think I've been talking to Yiwei about coming up with something in case we have a machine. The question is how to operationalize this, how to, get, how to uh, use this to better hemostatically resuscitate patients. So in conclusion, there's big score, but the big score is, I'm not saying big score is going to be the thing of the future, or the thing now, but big score reminds us that base deficit, coagulopathy, GCS is important, uh, and it sort of correlates with the good fight of coagulopathy, acidosis, and hypothermia. We do not permit hypertension, we permit tachycardia, and we should really actively look at how we can use TEM to better go the therapy in immunostatic resuscitation as part of the overall stabilization of the situation. So 
So I know Rahul was focusing on C, so C is very important, but C is coagulation, dissipation as well as coagulation. And I think those two are together. Huh? A and B, like you said, is not that it's not important, but it's important. And we have lots of other artifacts there. And how this, and of course this, by, by further refining how we stabilize these patients, we, we will be able to mitigate some of the important things in the new diet, as well as Somebody asked the question last year at the trauma conference about the golden hour. But I think if we nowadays at all this point in fact, testing that the golden hour is going to be exposed to 20 to 5 minutes or 60 to 30 minutes, not every hour. But I think if we can use all these tools at disposal and we are aware of temperature and other things and exercises and so on, I think we can save the cases better. That's it. Thank you.